So today uh, we'll, we're, we're going to uh, finish this whirlwind tour through problems, um, different types of problems and formulations and things like that, and some named problem classes. Uh, so last time I think we, we quit uh, right around here on, on quasi-convex optimization. So that's when you minimize a quasi-convex objective. Um, and uh, here you have to be, I mean, you should be a little bit worried because in fact, uh, the basic, you know, probably the most important fact about convex problems is that you can have a local minimum. You can't have a local minimum that's not a, a global minimum, right? But for quasi-convex optimization, that's false. You, you can have that, right? So you have to be a little bit more careful. Um, not that much careful. It's not that hard to solve. Um, so the way you do this is uh, if a function is quasi-convex, it means its sublevel sets are convex. And so what we introduce is a function whose zero sublevel set is the T sublevel set of your function, um, and uh, so what? So so this uh, this function has to be convex, right? So phi t and how you construct phi t? There are completely generic constructions of it. They're not useful, but you know when people ask you, how do you come up with that phi of t? You you can always do it. Often it just is suggested by the by the problem. We looked at an example last time that was this. Um, I mean, here's an interesting one. It's the ratio of of a non-negative over a positive function, uh, the numerator is convex and the denominator is concave, right? So uh, th this function here, it is definitely not convex necessarily, but it is quasi-convex. And to check that, what you do is you look at the sublevel set of this. Of P of, you know, when is it true that P of x divided by Q of x is less than or equal to t? If t is negative, uh, then this is simple, uh, right? Because then the sublevel set is empty and that's convex, so that's cool. So we really only have to worry about t positive. So if t is positive, then p of x over q of x is less than t. Um, well, this is true without the t positive. That's true if and only if p of x minus t q of x is, uh, is less than or equal to zero, okay? Now, now the critical part. This is a convex function of x provided t is positive. That's because Q is concave, right? So, so you're, you're just using one of these simple rules in your head. That's concave multiplied by T positive, still concave, minus now it's convex. And then it's a sum, right? So this is the example. Um, and what this allows you to do is really cool. It says that if I wanted to check, does there exist an X for which F0 of X is less than T? I can check it by solving a convex feasibility problem, right? So that's the that's kind of the idea here, which is really cool. And then, of course, what you could do is you can just do bisection, right? You just say, well, uh, can you find an x where f0 of x is less than 1.5? And if the answer is yes, then you go, cool. And by the way, you now have a feasible point with an objective value of 1.5 or better. Um, then you'd say, all right, how about 1? Or how about 0.5? Or how about minus 1? This kind of thing. So, I mean, not minus one in this case, but still. Um, so that, anyway, that's how, that's, that's just bisection. And that, that actually uh, works. Um, so, you know, the algorithm is actually just what I said. I start with uh, an upper and a lower bound on the uh, optimal value of the objective. I, I just query, I ask, uh, what I do is I, I take the midpoint of that interval and I ask, is there a, is there a, a, I solve a convex feasibility problem uh, to find out if these inequalities hold. If they do, then that tells you that P star is less than or equal to that value, right? It means, it means you're above. And by the way, now I update my upper bound. I pull it down to this halfway mark. If it goes the other way around, I take my lower bound and I pull it up to the halfway mark. And what this tells you is that your, let's see, your interval of ignorance about the optimal value Right, that's P star is in some interval. That interval shrinks by a factor of two every iteration, right? So, or if you like, you could even say this. You could say that you obtain one bit of information about P star every time you solve one of these convex feasibility problems, right? And by one bit, I mean that, you know, it, it's, uh, you, you actually reduce your uncertainty exactly by a factor of two, okay? So, so that's it. And this is, you know, this is kind of standard and it works and so on. So that's, uh, that's quasi-convex optimization. Okay. 
What we're going to do now is we're going to uh, talk about a whole bunch of different problems. Some of them actually have names. So there's named problem classes. Um, I'm just trying to think, you know, it's maybe much less important these days that you know these. Um, but things like this is just basic and there'll be people who don't know other stuff and they'll know these. So you just, you just have to know these, uh, these names, right? So uh, linear program is a fa famous one. That's uh, LP. Um, and we, we already encountered this a couple of weeks ago. It's, it's minimize an affine function subject to a set of affine uh, inequality constraints here and, a, and an equality constraint. Or another way to say it is, you know, the D doesn't matter here. If I remove D, this becomes an equivalent problem. It's not the same, it's equivalent. Uh, it's an equivalent problem. And so it basically says minimize a linear function over a polyhedron. So that's, that's actually another way to state what a, what a linear program is. Okay? So, um, so actually, there's this, you know, the modern history starts in around the 40s for linear programming. But in fact, I think Fourier wrote a paper about linear programming. So that tells you it's not, it's not totally new. Um, it became a whole lot more interesting when you could actually compute stuff. So that would be after the age of computers. So, okay. Um, so a picture looks like this, right? Here's your feasible set. It's a polyhedron. Each of these faces is a row, a single linear inequality, right? So that's what this is. And so these are the feasible points. And there's a vector C. It points this direction. These, these are the level, these dashed lines show you the level curves of the objective, which is C transpose X, right? Obviously, it's going to be uh, orthogonal. They're orthogonal to C. <coughs> and what it says is, you know, this might be three, two, one, zero. Okay, like, and so on. I mean, this, there'd be minus one, minus two, and so on, right? So, and so your job is to basically slide in, in this thing, go this direction as far as you possibly can. And that would be like this point here, right? So, um, I mean, this is very, I mean, this picture is not a bad one to have in your mind because it explains what an, L, what an LP is. You know, obviously, we are not interested in solving LPs with two variables because you could do it with your eyeball, okay? So what we're interested in is solving LPs with 10,000 variables and 30,000 constraints, okay? People do that all, like right now, I guarantee you a lot of those are being done right now. It's used for all sorts of things like scheduling, supply chain stuff. It's just used everywhere. Okay? So like in my opinion, everyone should know about it, okay? This is linear programming. So um, actually, the first example is historical. And I think that's, it's kind of cool because it's, but well, it's just part respecting history anyway. So this is from maybe from maybe 1940s or 50s. Um, and it's the diet problem. Um, so I think it, you know, allegedly, you know, was supposed to be, you know, uh, from the military. Like, how do you, how do you, um, how do you construct a diet that will keep soldiers alive? Uh, and as cheap as possible or something like that, right? So, I mean, whatever. So, it's a perfectly good problem. Here it is. Uh, so, you're going to, you have a bunch of foods and you're going to choose some quantities. These are going to be uh, non-negative. They can't be negative. Um, and what we'll have is we have a bunch of foods. So, food J, when you get one unit of it, doesn't matter what a unit is, but one unit of it um, is going to have an amount AIJ of nutrient I. So we care about a bunch of nutrients, right? Like you're, you know, you're maybe 10 or 20 or five or something like that, various nutrients. Um, and a healthy diet is gonna require nutrient I in at least a quantity uh, BI. So that, that's your sort of, let's say that's your minimum daily advised, blah, 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 whatever it is, right? Okay, so then immediately, well, not quite immediately, but I'll explain something here. So the, to find the cheapest healthy diet, you minimize, that's the cost of the foodstuffs. Um, and then you could even annotate, you can imagine annotating the constraints, which would be really good. So if I annotated that, that's not a constraint. I'd, I'd annotate that as that's the cost, total cost. This says the amounts have to be non, they have to be, they can't, they can't be negative, right? Um, and each line of this, you could annotate and say, this line says that's the minimum amount of protein in a diet, right? That's the something like that, right? Uh, now, technically speaking, if you look at this and then compare it to what we defined an LP to be, like this, um, it's not the same, right? Um, but here, we're going to start doing things where 
once you're what you know once I think at this point in the class and moving forward, um, you can do a couple of quick transformations of the problem without even mentioning it. So anyone would look at that and say that's an LP. It doesn't have exactly the right form. There's a few silly things like for example here, uh, you know the inequalities are they go the wrong way. In fact, both of them go the wrong way. So I'll just do this once and then never again. So what's going to happen is you have you know a x bigger than b, and also x is bigger than zero, and then we're going to write we're going to end up writing that. Let me get my notation down here. So the notation is g x less than h. So we're going to somehow write this as g x less than h, right? Um, anyway, anybody got some suggestions? Minus sign. Yeah, yeah, minus sign. I like it. Okay, so we'll start by doing this. We'll have like minus a. Uh, so this thing is equivalent to minus a x is less than or equal to minus b, and this one is equivalent to this. That zero is the same as minus zero. Everybody cool on that? That was step one. Then step two is you just stack, right? So you, you just do this, and that's less than uh, okay b and zero. Okay, so so here's g, and here's h. Okay, so. Everybody got that? So yeah, we'll never do that again. I'll never do that again. Let's put it that way. Um, and the truth is, you don't have to either, because you know modern languages, which you'll be using shortly uh, to do this, will do all this stuff for you. Okay, so so you don't have to. But you know, in the old days, or every actually every now and then, you might meet a colleague, you might be in an internship or something like that, find someone who's using linear programming or something like that, and they would they'd say, you know, how long did it take you to do? And they would say, oh, it's a huge pain. Took me like weeks and weeks and weeks uh, because they had to convert their problem to they had to do this kind of stuff and keep track of everything, right? And then to debug that is not fun and so on. So we refer to that, I guess, kind of derisively as matrix stuffing. So, right? The question? Identical or equivalent problem? Ah, okay. Uh, good question. These are actually equivalent. Yeah, because yeah, yeah actually. I, I think actually that doesn't even fit our general. You know, our, our general form was very restricted. It was like you know, f i is less than or equal to zero and stuff. So, uh, but for sure, even if I mean, it's, yeah, when you do these small transformations, which keep everything equivalent, uh, there the two thing the thing you transform something or reduce something to to use the computer science term um, is not the same problem. It is equivalent. Yeah. So okay. Um, all right. So back to uh, oh, so that's our that's our uh, here's our here's our our healthiest diet thing. Um, what if I had an upper limit on a nutrient? I mean, could I could we handle it? Yeah, it's kind of something similar. Like the answer is sure. That 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 would be. We could certainly do that. Um, what if there were like supply availability issues and some of these goods, some of these foods are only available up to some current limit of supply. Of course you could handle that. So once you start figuring out how to do this, you'll, you can see that it's, it, there's, it's very expressive. There's a lot of stuff you could do with it. Okay? So, so this is, a, this is a, just a very famous historical example. I think it's probably one of the first ones that people ever uh, you know, uh, talked about. Okay. Next up for fun is piecewise linear minimization. So this is a piecewise linear function, right? Uh, expressed as the maximum of a bunch of affine functions. So each, each one of those has a graph that's like a plane, and then you just intersect them, and that's your piecewise linear function, right? And then you want to minimize it, right? Um, and so the way this would work is if I walk up to you and I said, is that an LP? You would have to say no, because I mean, to check if something is an LP or a linear program, the first thing you do is you check the obje is the objective linear or affine. It's not, right? I mean, if m is more than one, it's it's not affine, right? Okay. So, um, but in fact, this easily converts to an LP, um, and you do that by the epigraph form. So you just introduce a new variable t here, and then these constraints here basically say that x t is in the epigraph of that function. Or you could just think of it this way. It just says that t is an upper bound on the max of these things. This says, so this would typically, this would actually, this problem here says minimize the upper bound on the max, but also mess with the x's, right? And so you can quickly argue, you, you could easily 
It, it's not, I mean, someone has to do it, but you could show that these are actually equivalent. Um, actually, sp quite specifically, if you solve that, that's an LP. That's an honest LP right there. That, that is a linear objective. Um, and these are like linear constraints. Okay, fine. If you wanted to, put the T on the other side, right? But that's, that's sort of in, in that thing, and I'm not going to show that type of thing. Everybody got this? So it's kind of, uh, it's kind of cool. And this already is actually kind of useful. Um, just to the ability to know. And by the way, most people, let's see, if you're actually doing this kind of stuff, if you came up with this and someone said, well, cool, but how do I solve that? People just look at you and go like, uh, it's an LP. So people would expect you to know that. Okay? Or cool people would anyway. Other people would, would I don't, God only, God only knows what they would do. Uh, well, I, I do know some of the things they would do. Okay. Okay. So we'll look at another example, again, of linear programming. Actually, I think it's, it's actually our first glant, you know, glimpse at this, uh, this issue of finding a point that's, actually, it's our second. Find a point that's, central, that's, that's deep inside a set, like a center. I think we talked about, we already found, we already encountered it once. It was the yield center. It says, here's your, here's your region of stuff that works. Dial up the machines to get a target so that your yield is maximized. So that was one notion of the center. Um, this is another one, is a Chebyshev center. So here's my, uh, here's my polyhedron described by uh, linear inequalities. And that your job uh, is, is this. Uh, you want to find the largest inscribed ball. Inscribed means it's inside the polyhedron. And you want, basically, you want, it to, you want to find the largest ball that fits inside the polyhedron. Everybody got it? So that, that's, that's the question. Um, let me just mention one thing right here, because it, it's probably worth mentioning. Um, if someone comes up to you and says, you know, I mean, if we're talking about linear programming, right? Then here are the things, uh, first of all, a part of your brain should light up, right? Um, on the geometric side, you should see pictures of like flat functions, you know, affine functions. Maybe you should also see pictures of piecewise affine functions, right? Those are, those, those are the things that should light up when I say linear programming to you in your brain, right? We know this. We actually do take students, put them in MRI machines and check these things. Actually, we don't, but, but we, we could. If we did, then every time after that, I could actually honestly say we did this. But so, so, well, I, I may even think, I'll think about it. Um, okay. Um, all right. So what I was saying is that the minute you get to a two norm, a, a rather different part of your brain should light up, right? Because when I say two norm to you, here's visually, here's what should be showing up. Things that are round, balls, Euclidean distances, right? Which should not be stored anywhere near the part of your brain that lights up when I say linear program, which should be piecewise linear things, flat things, affine things, that kind of, everybody following this? So honestly, when you're listening and you see that, and you just see this ball here, you should say, I, there's no way that something involving a quadratic is going to end up as a linear program. I'm just, I mean, obviously it does, because it's right here on the slide, but the point is, I'm just, I'm just saying it's a little bit surprising, right? So, okay. All right, so how do you solve that? How do you find the, how do you find the ball, the largest ball that fits inside a polyhedron? Well, here's what you do. Um, what you do, the first thing you ask is when, when is it true that a ball is in a half space? Because then to say a ball is in a polyhedron is to say it's in all of these half spaces because the polyhedron is the intersection of the half spaces. Okay, so when is a ball in a half space? And the answer is kind of interesting. We parameterize the ball by its center and its radius. That's a vector and a, not a positive scalar. Okay? Okay, so here it is. Um, when is it true? What you want to do is you want to maximize this over the ball, and you want that maximum to be less than bi. Uh, but that we can solve. If I ask you to maximize an inner product over a ball, it's, it's easy. We can do that exactly, right? Because it's, first of all, there's the Cauchy Schwartz inequality. Basically, the Cauchy Schwartz inequality is tight. That, that's what happens, right? And so it turns out, this, this thing, that's the maximum value of this thing over a ball, of, of this, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, that's right. That's the maximum value of this over the ball, and it's equal to AI transpose XC. That's this term. Plus, and then over here we have AI transpose U, but U is less than R, and so by Cauchy-Schwartz, that's definitely, that's an upper bound, but in fact, it's equal if I take U the right way. 
right? So in fact, you would be AI appropriately scaled, okay? So uh, it says that you get that B is a subset of P if and only if this holds for each I. So that's this constraint here. Now, when you look at this, uh, again, you see a two norm here. And so there should be like a, at least a yellow light flashing somewhere. Like this is not gonna be an LP because it's got a two norm. It'd be the same if there was an exp or a sine or a cosine. You would say, doesn't sound like LP to me, okay? But you just gotta, you just gotta be very careful here and take a look at this. Uh, the variables are R and XC. And the objective is what is linear, that's cool. And then we look at these constraints. Again, the two norm is causing this, you know, either discomfort or yellow flashing light, right? Which is warning, warning, may not be, need not be LP ahead. But, um, but that's a, a, AI is given data. It describes a face of the polyhedron. So that's just a positive number. What kind of, what kind of constraint is that in the variables, which are XC and R? It's just linear. Okay, so, I mean, maybe I made too big a deal out of it. Anyway, so, by the way, practical conclusion is you can solve this problem, um, even at enormous scales. Okay, so, so there you go. Um, by the way, is the Chebyshev center of a polyhedron, is it unique? Is it? I see some people saying no. No. How come? What's an example? A rectangle would have a body. I like it. Okay, so here's a, here's a rectangle, right? This is going to come out terribly, but okay. That's a, if that were inside, that would, that would have been a Chebyshev, uh, that would have been a, a Chebyshev, uh, a solution to the Chebyshev problem, but so is this. Okay. So, right. So, so that, anyway, so it's, it's not. Um, okay. By the way, this is already kind of uh, quite, quite useful here, right? Because it's, it's already, it, it, I mean, this already has like just immediate applications, right? So, okay. Um, next up, uh, I think we're at around 1950 or something like that. So <laughs> uh, here, here we are. This is, uh, yeah, so part of this is also historical, but it's not bad to know these names, right? So um, here's one. So a linear fractional program, that looks like this. Um, you minimize a linear fractional function. That's a ratio of two, uh, of two affine functions where actually by convention, we assume the domain is where the denominator is positive. Okay, so that, that's what that is. Um, and then set just over a polyhedron, that, that's all. Okay, now it's a quasi-convex problem and we just talked about how to solve them. So you can always solve a linear fractional problem by doing bisection where you're calling an LP solver in each step, <coughs> right? So we, we just, that's part of the generic thing. Um, but what's cool here, and this was figured out maybe also in the, maybe the 50s or early 60s, I, I don't remember exactly. Um, it turns out you can solve this problem as a single LP. And I'm not gonna, I won't get into the details, but it's, it's something where you can look in the book, look here. It's not totally obvious uh, how to do this. Um, you, yeah, you introduce some new variables. I, I think I won't go into it and you reparameterize. And in fact, it has to do with this perspective transformation. I'm, I'm not gonna say anything. So by the way, you should not, there's no way a person can look at that with this and then say, look at this and go, oh yeah, no, I, I totally see it. So this is an example of a problem transformation that's not obvious. Okay? And I think I'm, I'm not gonna take the time to go into it, okay? So the others have all been obvious, right? Like, you know, you can move, take an inequality that's a bigger than or equal to, multiply everything by minus one, and now it's a less than or equal to, right? These, this one is not. Actually, there's a whole bunch that are not, which we'll get to. Okay, um, now a generalization of that is this so-called uh, that people call it generalized linear fractional problem. That's a maximum of a bunch of these. These are actually quasi-convex, and the maximum of a bunch of quasi-convex functions is quasi-convex. So that's quasi-convex. And, and in fact, for this problem, the only way to solve it is in fact by bisection, as far as I know. I mean, not that it matters, right? But okay, and here's a very famous example of that's from uh, von Neumann, and it's the, it's, the, it's the von Neumann model of a growing economy, right? So let me explain what it is. We have two sets of variables. Um, X and X plus, and each of those, they're non-negative, and they, they represent, um, hey, wait a minute, do we have X? Hey, shouldn't I have X bigger than or equal to zero here? 
Yeah, we should. Or or maybe we. Oh, maybe maybe it's it's absorbed in the uh, denominator of this. Sorry. Okay, I confused myself momentarily. My confusion is over now, though. So, so everything's cool. Okay. Um, here it is. Uh, okay. So X plus is the uh, economic activity across n sectors of an economy. X is the current economic activity across n sectors in an economy. Right. Um, Xi plus over Xi is literally the growth in that sector of the economy. So you would say, I don't know, you know, steel manufacturing went up 6%. It means that this number is 1.06. If it's 0.93, it means that it actually contracted 7%. Everybody got it? Okay, so here's what we want. We want to figure out um, what would be the right economic activity levels to maximize the minimum growth in sectors across the economy. That's, that's this, right? Okay. Um, okay. Here are the constraints. Here's how X and X plus are, are constrained. Um, they're constrained this way. We have two matrices. We have a number of, of, of goods um, that are consumed uh, and, you know, that are consumed and also uh, produced, right? By, by economic activity, right? So, one unit of economic activity in sector I might consume a bunch of things. Actually, it's going to have positive and negative side, right? Because if, it, if it's consuming, it'll, you know, it'll have all sorts of stuff that it's maybe consuming, but it's also producing stuff, you know, like manufacturing automobiles. You have, it consumes steel and, you know, various other things. And, you know, then it produces cars, like just as an example. Okay. So, what this says is, uh, so AX... A, when you multiply the matrix A by, A by the vector X, what you get is the vector of, you get what is produced this year. That, that, that's the set of goods that were produced this year. It would be, so, and the model here is very simple that whatever, what, if this is year, quarters, or months, it doesn't matter. The, the idea is that what's produced this year, we kind of imagine is not immediately fed into uh, various, but it's almost as if, well, we, we do this in discrete time. So what's produced now is kind of held in escrow for a year, and then on January 1st, uh, everything starts up again, and you can you use those. And so what this says is that's the that's the vector of resources consumed by economic activity next year, and it says that is less than or equal to what you produced this year. And there's tons of variations on this, right? You could you know we could we could do all sorts of variations on this. We could have, for example, we could do this for ten periods and have a running. Um, you know, a, a stockpile of stuff, right? Uh, so, okay, everybody, but this is the basic one. It makes sense? Okay, and this is just immediately a generalized linear fractional problem. A few things here, I'm maximizing a min, whereas this thing should say minimize, minimize a maximum, right? But you just flip the sign and everything's cool. Okay, everybody got it? So, and by the way, things like this, these are, these are not obvious things, right? I guarantee you with 10, 10 sectors, I, you could not figure this out by hand. I mean, it's just absolutely out of the question, right? So, I mean, but of course, we can solve a problem like that with 10,000 sectors, like with no problem at all. Like you could, let me put it that way, right? So everybody got this? So it's kind of cool. Um, okay. Next up, uh, we're probably early 1950s, is the so-called quadratic program. This is all. This is like linear programming. This is actually a problem class that you need to know about, just because, you know, it's it's a thing. People talk about it. I guarantee when you go various places, I don't care the field. Someone will say how do you do that, and someone will say it's a QP or something like that, right? So, so quadratic program is this. Uh, the constraints are still uh, linear, just like an LP. Uh, so we have a poly a polyhedron is your feasible set, but the objective is a convex quadratic. Okay, so that, that's the idea. And here, the only thing that changes is, here's your polyhedron, which is your, your, this thing, and the sublevel sets, remember in an LP, they're just, they're high, the, the not sublevel sets, well, sublevel sets are, are, are su half spaces. The level sets were hyperplanes. Now the level sets are actually the surfaces of ellipsoids. I mean, if P is positive definite. If it's not, then it's the surface of a, I don't know, whatever, I don't know what people call it, degenerate ellipsoid or something like that. Okay, so, and this is the picture. Right, you you want to go downhill here to the minimum, um, 
and uh, you know, while staying in here, and here you'll find out it's right here. And actually, you can see our optimality condition here, that when you're optimal, the, the negative gradient, which is pointing you towards, uh, you know, towards the unconstrained minimum, I mean, roughly here, um, is actually an outward normal of the feasible set, right? And by the way, if that were not the case, I could wiggle x and do a little bit better, right? Everybody got that? So this is a good picture. Um, I mean, what it doesn't, what this doesn't tell you is that, I mean, and the point here, it's a, you should have this picture in your mind for sure. Um, but I guess the main point here is that we can solve QPs with 50, you can solve QPs with 50,000 variables and it's just, it's nothing. It's just nothing. It can be done so reliably that you can actually have this embedded in control systems and have this done a hundred times a second with a failure rate of zero. Okay. Just. Okay, so that's, that's from, yeah. So everyone see the, like the Falcon 9 first stages land, right? That's running, that's running multiple QPs all the time. One is running at a thousand times a second and it does not fail, okay? So, so people, I mean, people use, I'd say this, just QP alone is running probably I would say more than half of all quantitative hedge funds just run QPs, period, period, right? So what that means is there are many trillions of dollars uh, trading right now on, on just a QP that's being solved. So, okay. So I'm just saying it's, it's, it's not bad to know about. So, okay. Uh, let's look at some examples. Oh, wait, here's, here's a really simple one. Without constraints, it, it, you would get things like just least squares, right? So, yeah, and you know, we, we know how to solve that. And that's just linear algebra. But here's what's cool is you can have uh, linear constraints now. So, I mean, and this is, uh, I mean, you can add linear constraints. And it's, that's, that's, and actually the, you can add linear constraints, but the critical part of that is to say, if you add linear constraints, the problem is still entirely tractable. Okay. So, and I guarantee you there are fields where they do not know that. Okay. Every, every year people, I, I have people say like, oh yeah, you know, we're fitting these parameters and we do these very complicated experiments or, you know, long computations, but you know, the parameters like have, some of the parameters have to be in ranges. Like they have, some of them have to be non-negative and then they'll invent some unbelievably complicated, terrible method for like iteratively doing stuff. And you're like, the right answer is, dude, that's a QP. Like, just solve it. Like, just be quiet. Like, it's done kind of thing, right? Um, okay, so, um, yeah. I mean, and there's lots of interesting, I mean, even just this one, there's whole, so, oh, here's a fun one. Um, to do least squares, where I insist, I'm going to insist that the entries of X are non-decreasing. Everybody got that? So X1 is less than or equal to X2, is less than or equal to X3, and so on. That, by the way, would be a really good model of like wear and tear and damage in the system. So if a jet engine's running, then we'll just assume that, you know, if I pull it apart and go in there and like start measuring all my critical clearances, I'm not going to, after it runs another 10,000 hours of flight, I'm not going to find that it's in better shape than it was before, right? There, so that would be, so that, that's by the way, a whole field in statistics, I think it's called isotonic regression or something like that. There's whole books written on it. Like, so it's, which I find kind of humorous, right? Cause, cause it's, cause here's how we do it. It's so, I mean, for us, it's just really simple. It's like, excuse me, it's a QP. Like that's what it is. So, um, and so what it means is you don't, you don't, you should not, and you do not need to talk about how to solve it. I mean, you can't have an intelligent conversation about it if you want to do it at super big scale, if you want to do it and, in, and, and, and embed it in some safety critical thing so that it's, its failure rate has to be zero, right? Then we can have a sensible conversation, but you can't have, other, other than that, it's silly. That's for you starting next week. It's, uh, I believe, one line of Python. Two, fine, two, right? So it's nothing. Okay, everybody got this? So. I mean, it's already, these are already like, these are useful things right here. Uh, so um, here's one, let's, let's do linear program with random cost. And this is actually the, um, it's actually kind of interesting. So that's a huge, um, that, that, that's a huge area. It's, it's called a robustness, right? And what it says is it acknowledges the, fa so here's a, okay, let's step back and I'll give you the big picture on, on robustness. When people use 
optimization, they, you know, you, you, you're assuming like your, your, your constraints and your objective and all that, they're sort of like, quote, accurate to like eight significant figures. That's kind of what you're doing. And you're modeling everything by floats and things like that, right? So, so it's not, you know, it shouldn't take much uh, if you've done anything in engineering or anything actually in any kind of real field. Uh, you would know that, of course, they don't know the coefficients, right? Like in our diet problem, um, every number in a, you know, like the costs, they, you know, it's because you ask somebody or, or you check some market or something, but maybe the costs have changed in the last two days. You know, you know what I'm saying, right? Um, if I have a model of a mechanical system, maybe I'm manufacturing it really well, but you don't, you don't know the Young's, you don't know the third digit of the Young's modulus. That's ridiculous. Um, it's absurd, in fact, right? In finance, I guess my friends say uh, about their models, they said, we're happy if we get the sign right. Right, uh, strongly suggesting that I mean everyone knows the third digit is like a, just a complete joke, right? The second digit is actually kind of a joke too, right? So they're they're worried about the leading sign, right? So okay, anyway, so there's lots of ways that people handle this. We're going to come back and talk about this in great detail later. It's actually the entirety of like regularization. It comes up in in statistics and model fitting. There it comes up everywhere, right? Um, okay, so this will be our first foray into it. Um, so what we're going to do is we're just going to say that uh, the cost is random. So when you, so the way this, this problem is going to go like this, um, it says when you choose an X, uh, we don't even speak to you if X does not, is not feasible. So it has to sound about X equals B, G, X less than H. So that's, let's say I construct a diet, right? And then the problem is now the cost. Yeah, I'd say, well, how much is it going to cost me? And they're like, I don't know. It's a random variable. You go, oh, okay. And so, you know, you could do things like just minimize the mean on average. I mean, and if you're going to do this every 10 seconds for like the next year, you know, the argument would be everything would average out and that'd be cool. Um, but you might also care about the, the, uh, the for example, the variance. And, you, and by the way, this can get way fancier and we'll do that later. Uh, so here, this is a very traditional thing is this is, that's the cost. That's the mean cost. And then gamma is a positive number. That's called the risk aversion parameter. Sigma is the covariance of C, right? And so this is the variance of the cost induced by your choice of X, okay? Um, so that's, that's the idea. And then this people would call the risk adjusted cost. That's what that would be called, right? Like say, and you'd probably quote it. And I mean, it's probably, honestly, you'd probably take the square, a, a more sensible thing would be to take a square root here, but this is fine. Right, because then they're on the same units, right? But anyway, so that's what this is. This is called risk-adjusted cost. Um, oh, and you, in principle, okay, so anyway, when you do this, that's, that's a QP, right? Because that's a, that's a convex quadratic function. Oh, provided gamma is positive, right? Um, if gamma is negative, that's interesting. Um, in fact, what, what do you, if someone's doing, if, gamma, if you, if you want to minimize a risk-adjusted cost with a gamma negative, that's called risk-seeking. Um, and... Uh, okay, but just a couple of things about solving, about that problem. A, it's a really stupid thing to do because you're saying like, I mean, unless you're, it's like some thrill seeker, you can imagine something where you're like, yeah, I'd, I'd like the same mean, but I'd like the variance to be way bigger. I mean, it just it doesn't make any, so number one, it's a stupid thing to do. Number two, let's talk about the computational complexity. If someone says, no, 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 you don't understand. I really, I'm, I'm designing, I'm doing some entertainment thing. It has, to, it has to be, there has to be some thrills in there. So I want gamma to be minus 0.1. Um, is that a QP? No. It's not. Because this becomes no longer, it's no longer convex, right? So anyway, so this actually occurs a lot uh, where you, you have something where uh, there's a box with, the, the things that, th these are the problems that are easy to solve. These are the problems that are hard to solve. These are the problems that are sensible to solve. And these are the problems that are really stupid to solve. And it doesn't split up 25, 25, 25, 25 all the time. I mean, it's actually quite, it's very usual that the problem you should be solving is actually the one that's solvable. And then the, the, other, the other problem, the other types of problems are ones that A, you should not be solving and B, that's just fine because you can't do it anyway. So anyway, it's just weird, and that's just how it works out. Okay. Um, oh, this leads us to another one. Yeah, you don't hear so much about this anymore, but you still do, is QCQP. 
Um, and so this is where, wow, you know, instead of having linear inequalities, you now have convex quadratic. Okay, so this is a, that's a so-called QCQP. And you'll, you'll still hear some people talk about that. Okay, now we get to something that's kind of modern, meaning it's from the last 25 years. Okay, and it looks just like, like QCQP or something like that, but it's not. Um, and it's, it's also like an incredible, it's an innocent looking problem. It's uh, truly unbelievable what problems can be reduced to this. Okay, so let's take a look at it. It's, you minimize a linear function. That's cool, that's like linear programming. You have linear uh, equality constraints. Um, and then you have a bunch of constraints that, by the way, if this was just, z if I made A and B zero, this would be zero. This would be a general LP. So what that says is whatever second order cone programming is, it generalizes LP for sure. Because any LP I can solve with SOCP, right? And it just looks like this. And so it's a, it's a two norm, by the way, this is two norm and it is not two norm squared, right? So that's one of the things you have to fight um, that because of our collective training and, and hundreds of years of math before us, whenever you see a two norm, you square it, right? We all know this, right? Everybody does that and you don't. And you know, there might be some good reasons, right? Like now you get this analytical solution or I don't know, this kind of, so now it's differentiable and I don't know. So. But, the, but mostly it's because it's because of, it's historical. That's, that's really why it is, why we square it. So anyway, very important point, this is not squared, okay? Um, okay, so that's a second order cone program. And uh, why? Because basically this constraint here says that the image uh, under an affine mapping is in the second order cone. That's what it says, right? Because the second order cone is all things of the form, you know, Two norm of u is less than v. Use a vector, v is a scalar. And that's exactly what this is. This says the two norm of that is less than that. And that's exactly what this is, right? So that's it. And, and this, this includes like QCQP, LP. Actually, weird secret, it actually in includes probably 95% of any problem you would ever want to solve from 100 different fields, okay? So you will, be, you will start using like CVX pi you'll write down like weird functions like quadratic over lin and all sorts of other crazy stuff, really complicated geometric means, all sorts of weird stuff. They will be reduced to an SOCP and solved. Okay, so this is kind of the, uh, yeah, this is the idea. So, this, and this is, you know, like I said, this is kind of relatively new. Um, it's also, I think for a broad uh, group of, of, of problems, it's, it's almost like, it, it, this, is the, this is kind of the low level uh, language. This is like the three byte code of convex optimization, roughly for a reasonable fraction of it, right? That what it is is you write a problem a high form, in a high level form, it gets compiled into a second order cone program and then it gets solved. And what, what's nice about that arrangement is it means that people all over the world right now are working on solvers for second order cone programs. Why? Because a, a much larger group of people is actually solving problems that they don't even know can be reduced <laughs> to second order cone programs, but then, so it all works out very well. Okay, so, okay. Um, let's do an example. We'll do uh, robust linear programming. Um, and here's the way it's gonna work. Um, so this time, uh, before we said the objective is, is, un, is, is uncertain, now we're, gonna, now we're gonna make the uh, inequalities uncertain, right? Um, and what we're going to do is uh, we will we'll look at what happens. We're going to look at just what happens when AI is uncertain, right? So, and you know, look in our diet problem that says, oh, how much, you know, how, mu how many nutrients do you get uh, per gram of this food stuff, right? And the answer is, I don't know, depends on the shipment. Like, you know, we yanked, uh, we yanked a couple. Actually, you know, in June, they're slightly different, you know, and whatever. And by the way, Friday's batch is different from Thursday's. I mean, not grossly, but they'll be, they could be, it could easily be considerable, right? So anyway, so you do that. By the way, then you fit an ellipsoid to those. You, you, and then, then what you're doing is you're saying, please construct me a diet that satisfies, you know, these minimum like health requirements. And you'd say, oh, but I want this diet, that should work no matter what gets delivered to us uh, with different amounts of nutrients per food stuff. Everybody following this? 
that's that's the robust solution to that, right? So okay, so that looks like this. Um, okay, um, and a, another one is the stochastic model. In the stochastic model, you'd say, oh yeah, you know what? The AIs are random. They're just they're they're Gaussian or whatever. Some they have some distribution, and you'd say, yeah, I want the probability that the constraint holds to be greater than some number. You know, typical numbers of eta would be 0.9. That's pretty loose. 0.95, 0 0.99. Um, it could be 0.99999 or something like that. But and that's okay as long as you understand what you're doing when you solve that problem. Um, yeah. If someone said, yeah, no, 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 we do, we, 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 we make sure it works. You know, for like, you know, that, you know, that the probability is bigger than 99.9 percent. .9%. Of course, the question there is, there's no one in any field that I'm aware of who actually knows the distribution of something, the tail of their distribution that well. This is just, sorry, this is just a weird rant, but I'm just, I'm doing it anyway. Like there's no such thing, right? If you go, if you go to anywhere and, and someone says, oh, you know, no, we want, we want the probability to be more than 99.9%. .9%, it's hilarious to me, right? It's just ridiculous. Uh, okay, so, okay. Um, however, it's actually still a perfectly good problem to solve. Because when someone looks at your code and it says the probability should be bigger than 99.9%, .9%, you're like, wow, you must really have a good handle on the tails of that distribution. And then here's the correct answer. You go, ah, oh, yeah, no, we have, no, we have terrible models of the tail distribution. And you go, but your probability, and you go, that just means like, really, please, I want this to hold. That's, that's what it means. It doesn't mean anything more than that. So, okay. Everybody got that? So, well, that was weird. That was a weird rant. Okay. So, fine. Uh, okay, so let's do the deterministic one. That's going to turn into an SOCP. How do you do that? Well, we write the ellipsoids as a center plus here uh, a matrix, uh, a, a linear mapping of the unit ball. So that's my, so P tells me like the ellipsoid, where is it big, which axis is it big in and stuff like that. Okay, so that, by the way, that's one of several representation of ellipsoid. That's what we're going to use here. Okay, so we do this. Um, and here, if you want to know, uh, we really have to work out what is the maximum of this expression over that ellipsoid. And then you, d you would just end up with this, right? And now, again, we very, you know, we sit down. Um, we actually, with Chebyshev Center, we encountered something with a two norm, but the argument of it was, a con was data. And therefore, it was a constant and it was just a red flag and your, your yellow flashing light in your brain didn't matter. Here, though, we have to be careful. So you look at the problem. That's linear. That's cool. Um, and this objective is indeed uh, an, an, uh, a second-order cone uh, problem, a second-order cone constraint. People would say an SOC constraint here, right? Um, actually, it's super interesting, right? Like if you just said, you just said, you know what? I don't care about all this uncertainty stuff. I don't believe it. Besides, this stuff is only off by plus minus 5%. I don't care. Then what you do is you just replace the uh, A with AI bar, which is kind of the, uh, the middle value, right? So you just do that. If you do that, you get this problem here. That's an LP. But then you'd say, you'd say, yeah, but you know, there's uncertainty. So I would like a little bit of margin in my, in, in my inequality just to cover me when A m wiggles around, right? What's interesting is this tells you exactly how much margin to use. Right? So ob what this says is wherever P is big, you should avoid having X in that direction. It makes sense. In fact, you could even, you, you could literally flag that number and call that the, that, that is the margin. And the cool part is it's a function of X. It's a function of your choice. Everybody got this? So, okay. So that is a, uh, that's a, an example. So a, a, uh, you know, a rope, Robust LP with you know ellipsoidal uncertainty is in fact an SOCP. Okay, um, we can also do the same thing with a statistical model, and it works just fine. Um, weirdly, you also end up with an SOCP. So here, here I say, no, you know what? I don't know. I took enough statistics and stuff. So AI is Gaussian with a mean A bar. That's a, a vector and a covariance matrix, right? So that means that this linear function of it that's also Gaussian. Right, because linear function of a Gaussian vector is Gaussian, um, and it's got a mean a, a bar transpose x, and it's got a variance x transpose sigma x, and that means you know the probability that it means that this is just a that's just a Gaussian. So 
a scalar Gaussian, the probability of scalar Gaussian is less than a number is equal to this, right? You, you know, you subtract the mean and then you divide by the standard deviation, you get an N01 variable, and then you, uh, then you look at the CDF. So that's, that's the CDF of a, of a, of a Gaussian. Okay. Everybody following this? Um, yeah. By the way, it's not looking super good here because these are replaced with uh, the, 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 these, now you do know some things about that. For example, that's a log concave function, the Gaussian CDF, right? So, but doesn't sound like this is going to end up as a second order cone program, right? Because, you know, it just doesn't sound quadratic or something like that. So, but it is. And the reason is pretty straightforward. Um, you, what we want to do is we want to say that this thing is bigger than or equal to eta, right? Uh, eta is 0.95. There you go. Okay. But this phi is monotone, right? So this says this expression is bigger than phi inverse of eta. Everybody got that? Okay. Now phi inverse of eta is going to, it's going to be, uh, it's, it's going to be positive, right? Because eta is like 0.85 and stuff. Oh, actually, if eta is less than 50%, if eta is less than 50%, uh, phi inverse of eta is negative. Right? If I have a standard Gaussian and I say, what's the inverse CDF of 0.3? I don't know what it is, but it's like minus a half or something, roughly. I just made that up, but still. Everybody got this? Right? So, so provided that your required probability that the constraints hold is more than 50%, um, then, then you can actually multiply out this thing, this thing bigger than or equal to uh, phi inverse of eta, and you multiply it out like this. And lo and behold, it's an SOCP. Oh, actually, it's only an SOCP if eta, if this thing is, is bigger than a half. Because otherwise, this is negative, and then you got the wrong, you're, you're sitting on the wrong side of the inequality there. Everybody see that? So now, if someone came up to you and said, please help me solve this robust problem, and you go, what is it? You go, well, the thing is, I don't know the constraints, and they, they vary. And I'd say, well, how, with what probability would you like your constraints to hold? And if they said something like, oh, 15% would be good for me, like, you would say, go away. I mean, you'd check or whatever, but you'd send them away. And you could also say, and as they're leaving, right, you can shout out, it says, it says, not only is that stupid, but you can't even solve it. That's what I would say to that person. That's as they're leaving. Okay? Everybody got that? I mean, you, there are weird cases where you might have risk-seeking things. Uh, the closest I've ever come to hearing somebody describe uh, risk-seeking something was, okay, not socially positive, but it was somebody who was designing missile, uh, missile controllers. And they said, well, if you, know, if you have high probability of, of making a kill, do it. But we'll take 10% because otherwise it's, you already launched it, it's on its way, and it's not coming home, and you're not going to use it again. I don't know if everybody got that. So, and I, I think I even quasi accept that as, a, as an actual application, but okay, if, if not a socially positive one. But anyway, okay. That's it. So, okay. Next up in our tour. Um, so, uh, next topic is geometric programming. Um, so, yeah, you're seeing a lot of stuff. This is very cool. This goes back into the 1940s and 50s. Actually, weirdly, it persisted. Well, let, let me explain what it is. Um, so it's, it's a class of optimization problems where we are going to apply. It is absolutely not a convex problem. There's no doubt about it. We'll look at it in a minute. It's very weird. Um, but it's not a convex problem. But what we're going to do is we're going to make a, a transformation. Uh, we're going to ch change the variables and change a few other things. That's all. And now it's, it's going to become convex under this change of variables. Now you can solve it. It scales to gigantic problems and all sorts of other stuff. Okay, so that's this is an example of that. We're going to see others in statistics. We're going to see them. We're going to see them in other areas too, right? So, um, okay. So, and it's got its own weird language. Um, oh, what the other thing I was going to say was, this was an entire field. People talked about it. People wrote books about it from the '60s, all sorts of stuff. It wasn't until like around 1980s that people actually realized it was convex. Oh, sorry, it's not convex. Can be reduced to an equivalent convex problem and therefore scaled. Right. It means, in fact, you don't even have to say anything at that point. You just stop and you say, it's done. Okay. So, um, although 
some of my friends who were in Moscow in the 60s said, oh, we all knew that. <laughs> like, oh, so I'm hardly surprised in the West they didn't know that. Anyway, so uh, everybody got this? Okay, so here it is. Um, and it's got its own secret language, which you should never use these words in the wrong situation because you will sound like an idiot uh, unless, unless other people know the background and things like that. So here's what it is. Um, if I have a product, these are positive variables and I raise them to various powers, but the powers are just real numbers. They can be minus 1.3, plus 2.6, minus 3.5. That Everybody got that? Right. So, uh, so it's a product. By the way, I think people talk about this as a scaling law in a lot of engineering fields, right? Like, you know, how does this go with like Reynolds number and all that kind of stuff. So it's a scaling law. So I think some people are you're familiar with things that look like that. Okay, so um, anyway, so in this field of geometric programming, um, they decided to call this a monomial, okay? However, unfortunately, there is a definition of monomial in math, which has been used since like 1820 or something like that, and it is absolutely standard. It's like min. There is no doubt what a monomial is. A monomial is one and only one thing. It is a product of variables with integer exponents, and the coefficient in front can be anything, positive or negative. Everybody got that? So minus 3 x1 cubed times x squared times x5, that is, that's a monomial that you can say outside this room. But only in the context of geometric programming would you call this a monomial. So, so just, just, just a heads up, because if you say, if you use, you know, that's a monomial, and there's anybody around who doesn't know about geometric programming, they'll think you're an idiot. Okay, so, okay. And this is even worse, a posinomial. Like, and I'm sorry, we didn't make this up. This is, this is simply the name assigned to it in the 1960s. It's a sum of monomials. Okay, that's called a posinomial. And I think it's supposed to be like positive and monomial. Forget the fact that their use of monomial is not the absolutely standard use, right? So anyway, whatever. That's posinomial. Um, and then a geometric program looks like this. It says you have positive variables, that's implicit. Um, and you minimize a posinomial subject to, yeah, and don't say posinomial out. Make, if you say that, make sure everybody around you within any hearing distance kn knows about GP and knows that you know about GP. Otherwise, don't say that word uh, because, I mean, you could try it. Just walk over to the math department and see what happens. Um, but anyway. Um, okay, and then you, and you have equality constraints, right? So, you know, this is not remotely convex. I mean, these are, these are highly, this is highly nonlinear, right? I mean, here's an example of this. You know, x1 to the 1.3 times x2 to the minus 0.3 is equal to 1. Well, that's not, that is not affine last time I checked. It's not even close. Okay, everybody got that? Okay, that's a, that, that's a GP. And books were written about this in the 60s. People solve them by hand. I'm not kidding. Um, when they were easy enough, it's got kind of weird. But then here's what was discovered in the West in the 80s and supposedly in Moscow, everybody knew this in the 60s. So here it is. Um, what you do is you, cha you change variables. It, they're positive variables. So I'm gonna work with the logs. I call those Y, right? That's a change of variables. So I'm gonna have uh, YI. Um, and then when I have a monomial, what does that convert to? Well, it's the log. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, let's see what it is. A, um, a, uh, if you have f, right, this transforms to, these are exponentials, actually to the exponential of an affine function, right? If I take the log of a monomial, I get an affine function, okay? Um, then a posinomial is going to transform into a log sum exp of an affine function, and they're convex, right? So that means the geometric program over here, which is not remotely convex, is actually exactly equivalent to this problem. And this problem is convex, because look at this. Um, this is log sum exp of an affine function. Log sum exp is convex, and convex of affine is convex. So are all these. That's linear, affine. Whatever, however you want to say it. Everybody got this? So it's actually pretty cool. It's even cooler because 
Every time when you look at a practical field where people use geometric programming, you will find out that they already, either implicitly or not, figured out you should be working with logs. Okay? I'll give you an example. A lot of times there's power control for wireless systems or actually for cables, right? You, you, and actually, so engineers there, they use decibels to talk about powers. Well, guess what? That's the log, right? Um, if you go to circuit design and you'd say, well, tell me about my library. What sizes do these come in? And they go, oh yeah, you can get that, uh, you know, that whatever, that NAND gate. You can get it in a size 0.5, size 1, 1 1.4, 2, you know, 4, 8, 16. Sound familiar? Uh, what it means is they already knew in their hearts that, th that, that basically what was, what, it, it wasn't, you should not work with the size, you should work with the log of the size, right? Because that's what those numbers are, so. Yeah. Is it always the same K in like the objective and the inequality? Uh, let me think. Uh, uh, it, 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 let me think, let me think about that. Sorry. It, uh, it is, let me, it may not be actually, let me think. I don't think it is, you're right. Because uh, these are different, um, yeah, there's, some th there's something, yeah, the K doesn't have to be the same. No, wait a minute. No, it does not have to be. So, yeah, it d doesn't have it's to be. Like, it's not part of the definition of like... No, uh, no. It, 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 it wouldn't matter. So, okay. So, that's GP. Um, I'll, I, I'll go in one example. I'm not going to go through the details. I mean, actually, the real truth is I couldn't even defend the details. Um, but I will tell you a funny story about it. Uh, so, this is on a book. I, I found this in a book on um, optimization for engineering design. And... This example was held up as an example. They said, oh, here's a problem that is not convex. And that was literally the point of the example. That's a true statement. But you do the right sneaky change of variables, and it is convex. So, um, and so the problem is this, is you, you know, you, you're, you're going to design this cantilever beam. And you're very, uh, what, what you can do is uh, you, you can change the length. That's this thing that you could see here. But also the width, which you can't see. That's, that's how wide it is uh, over here. Um, and um, so that's, the, uh, that, 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 that's what this is. Um, and then we're going to put a, a, a force at the tip. And of course, I mean, you don't have to know any mechanical engineering to know it's going to deflect, right? And if you, if you make yourself a, you know, a giant thick thing with this is steel or something like that, it's going to be very stiff. Right? Because then when you push, you put a lot of newtons on it and it's barely going to budge. Right? Or I could make it sort of this flimsy small thing and I press it and it's going to really bend. Right? So that's, that's kind of, that means, and again, you don't have to know any mechanical engineering to know this. I mean, I, I don't know any, so that's fine. So it's fine. But that's just, that's the rough idea. Right? Um, and so your design problem is something like, you know, minimize the total weight subject to, I mean, these are just, uh, you know, this could even be manufacturing constraints, right? That you just, there's just limits to these. Um, you, you could have an upper, that's a geometric constraint. Um, you could have an upper bound on the stress in each segment. That, that's a reasonable model of, of you know, failure. Um, and, an upper, and then you want an upper bound on deflection of the beam at the end, right? So what you're saying is if I load this with 10 kilonewtons, I don't want it, I don't want it to sag more than three centimeters, right? That would be your spec. Okay, everybody got it? And by the way, problems like this, but simpler, were already being solved in the early 1950s in aerospace. They were doing exact, and they were using linear programming and uh, mostly linear programming in aerospace, right? Pretty cool, right? Because you're, you're, you know, if you design a bridge that people are going to drive over for 100 years, you build a lot of margin into it and stuff like that. If you're doing aerospace stuff, you can't, over you can't engineer stuff 5x over. Right, because it just weighs too much, and congratulations, now you have no payload, right? So there, it's delicate. You you want to you want to you want things to be as absolutely as light as possible, with uh, you know, but still actually uh, satisfy all the requirements that it's actually going to work, right? So, which means that it can't. It's got to be stiff enough. It's got to handle all sorts of dynamic loads, all that kind of stuff. So anyway, so that's the that's that's the idea. So stuff like this is done all the time. In fact. There's a whole field. It doesn't matter. I'll talk about that later. Okay, so that's it.
Okay, so uh, the, here it is in English. And then, you know, in words to work out what these things are, I'll just, I, I'm going to just talk about a few of the things and then not, I don't want to focus on it because it's not that critical to us. But here's the total weight. Uh, the variables, remember, are W and H. And I would like to ask you, what kind of function is that? I mean, aside from it being a posinomial, which you should not, never say in public. But what kind of function is this of W and H? Again, pretend you're in public. So you can use words that you're allowed to say in public. What kind of function is that? It's what? Okay, sorry, I missed that. Dot product? It's a dot product, right? Um, it's an inner product between W and H. Is it convex in W and H? No. It's a quadratic form, right? It's the quadratic form with matrix 0, like I, I, 0, right? So that, that is not, this is not convex. Right, so you know already we are not solving a convex problem. Or, yeah, well, when we get around to solving this, we'll do this change of variables and it will become a convex problem. Okay. Um, okay, so the, these various ratios are monomials and, and the, the maximum stress is a monomial, so those are fine to, to handle. The vertical deflection comes from, again, I couldn't defend this, but this is, uh, I mean, I suppose it's just like elementary, you know, baby physics and mechanics or whatever, but it's just, you, you start at the tip and you go back and this is a recursion that tells you this. What's kind of cool about this is you look at uh, various things uh, here. Um, but what you'll see is that each, each of these, right, if you start, th these, you can actually, by applying the rules, oh, I should say there's a full other set. You can transcribe all the rules you know for convex functions and they will, they will have analogs for like posinomials and monomials. And I'll give you some example, right? Let, let's just go back. I mean, um, okay. Okay, here we go. I want to do this. Um, talk, talk to me about the product of monomials. What is that? Product of two monomials. No, sorry. Two, I have two monomial functions. Again, not in the math sense, in the ge geometric programming sense. I have two monomial functions and I take the product. What is it? Monomial. It's a monomial. It's a monomial, right? Uh, what's the sum of two monomials? It's a posinomial, right? Okay. What's the product of two posinomials? Posinomial. All right. What's a posi What what is a posinomial divided by a monomial? It's a it's a posinomial. It's fine. Uh, what's a posinomial divided by a posinomial? Right. The answer is nothing. We don't know. Okay. So I'm just saying there's a bunch of these rules that, that you're gonna that, that you're gonna use. Um, and down here, I don't want to go into the details, but you know, you just argue that you know a sum of posinomials is posinomial or whatever that kind of thing. And what you'll end up finding is that these things are just posinomial functions. They're quite complicated, but they are posinomial functions, right? Anyway, then you you reassemble everything to look like this. Uh, and there it is in, in this standard GP form, right? Um, by the way, um, you don't have to do this, right? Because um, what's clear is that you can actually write these out in some object oriented in some domain specific language, and then something would do all of this stuff for you. And the truth is, you shouldn't even look at this any more than you should look if you actually the way you should look at, like, after you compile something, why would you look at the byte code or something like that, right? I mean, you could. A very small number of people have to because that's what they do. But the rest of us should never look at that. You know what I'm saying? And I think the same is kind of true for this, right? So, okay. Um, I think I'll, I'll skip this one. This is just some advanced uh, topics. And I'll talk about uh, a couple more uh, things. Uh, just. Actually, two, two more main topics. Um, okay. Oh, uh, to, to finish up the other one. Um, geometric programming is your first example of a wide class of non-convex problems that can be transformed to equivalent convex problems and therefore solved, right? So that's, that's the main point about it, okay? So it's actually kind of, in, we're going to see plenty of others, right? We'll see, that, we'll see it also happening in statistics and it happens in control and other areas where, um, in fact, I'll even tell you a story. I, I used to go around and give talks. This is a long, long time ago. Um, 
and I would say, look, here's a problem in control. Oh, it's convex. Here's another problem in control. Oh, look, it's convex. And I said, I had a slide that was like, I said, here's, a, here's an example of a problem. And I said, this is, I don't think it's convex, right? So I, anyway, so I went around and gave that talk to several thousand people. I was at Berkeley. I gave the talk. A colleague of mine came up to me afterwards and he said, oh, you see that problem that you just said was probably non-convex? I was like, yeah. And he said, can I show you something? I was like, sure. Anyway, he had some completely sick, demented change of variables. Like instead of this positive definite matrix, we're going to work at the inverse. And instead of these, we're going to work at the inverse of this times that. And I was like, Andy, why would anyone do that? And he goes, watch this. Two lines later, it's convex. And I step away and I'm like, oh no, oh no. I've been telling people all over the world that it was not convex. Then we looked at my slide and it was really awesome. It says, it says a problem that's not convex. And there was a little footnote and it said, probably. <laughs> so I was safe. Then, by the way, after that, I told that story every time. So I said, so yeah, so basically you should be very careful because this, this, anyway, so. Okay, fine. Back to this one. Now we're back to uh, honest convex problems. Okay, so uh, okay, so all we do here is the constraints. We're going to have vector constraints instead of uh, instead of just you know scalar inequalities, right? Um, you know the uh, a, a very famous example of that is called a conic form problem or a cone form problem, right? And that looks like this: you minimize a linear function subject to fx plus g is less than or equal to zero, but that's with respect to some cone k and ax equals b. What's cool is if k is the non-negative orthant, this is just a pedantic way to write down an LP, right? But the cool part is k could be other cones, and then you get, like, if I make k a product of second order cones, this is SOCP. But I can have other things too, and a very famous one is uh, so-called semi-definite programming. So, that's something you will see. This is probably, it's not bad to have heard it. People talk about it in actually a whole bunch of fields now, right? So in theoretical computer science, people blabber about it. I, people in physics use the, I, so it's, it's, it's become mainstream in the last 20, 25 years. Um, here it is. You minimize a linear function, subject to equality constraint, linear equality, it looks, and then you have a single inequality which looks like this. In fact, it, lo it looks like a linear inequality. If these were scalars and that was ordinary less than or equal to, this would be a single linear inequality. It would be a silly LP. But here, these are matrix symmetric matrices. And this says this linear combination, this affine function, which is a symmetric matrix, has to be negative semi-definite. Okay? So that's, a, that's called a semi-definite program. Um, and, uh, oh, this thing is called an LMI, a linear matrix inequality. It's like a linear inequality, except it's a matrix inequality. So, okay. Um, and, you know, th this things that you do, you don't, it, it, this says you only have one, but you could just diagonally stack them like this. Um, yeah. Oh, any, any suggestion? How would, I, how would I make, how would I represent an LP as an SDP? Any, any idea? You have multiple... I have 10 linear inequalities on X scalar. How do I, re yeah? It's a diagonal matrix. Yeah, you make, you make these matrices all diagonal, and that's diagonal. And then it's silly because a, di a diagonal matrix is less than or equal to zero, right? I mean, if and only if all the entries are, right? So, so this extends LP, you would say, right? So, okay, this is a, this is a semi-definite program. Um, okay. And as I said, you can easily represent these things. It also extends SDP um, and that, uh, sorry, SOCP. And that's also interesting, not obvious at all. Uh, and in fact, that goes through something called the sure complement, which is, ooh, should put that on oh, one of the nice coming homeworks. Yeah, okay, sorry. Okay, okay. So sure complement, it, it's this. Uh, this says, it has to do with a block matrix. Um, by the way, this is not a, everyone here has seen sure complement. It's just people didn't use that name, right? So, you know, if you're in statistics or probability, I mean, either you are or you took those classes, I hope, then this is conditioning on a Gaussian. But it's tons of other stuff. In mechan electrical engineering, it means you take a, an electrical circuit and you terminate a bunch of the ports, like you short those and you open circuit those, and then you ask, what, what does the rest of it look like? This is all, the, all these things are sure complements, right? So here it is. 
it says that a matrix, I, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to go into it now, but this inequality, which notice is like nonlinear, it's got this two norm, is equivalent to this thing. And this is, that's a matrix, which is affine in X, right? And the, the argument is this thing is positive semi-definite if and only if, you know, that's bigger than or equal to zero. And sort of this thing minus that times the inverse of that times that um, is, um, is, uh, is, is going to be less than or equal to uh, a zero, right? So that, or bigger than or equal to zero, that here, right? So that's that. So I, I won't go into that detail, but it's, um, it, it's interesting. Um, so I'll, I'll do an example. Here's an example. Um, you know, and these are like, we're already in the domain of like, these are not obvious problems, right? So here's one. I have a bunch of symmetric matrices. I'm going to form an affine combination of them. Uh, no, I mean, I'm going to form, uh, there's an affine function with these coefficients, right? And I'd like you to choose x1 through xn to minimize the maximum eigenvalue of that matrix. Okay, now we, are, we already discussed this. You know that's convex, right? But that doesn't mean it's obvious how to solve that problem. It turns out it's just an SDP and it just, it literally looks like that. It's really dumb. This is, by the way, that's an epigraph for the maximum eigenvalue, right? That the maximum eigenvalue is less than something if and only if that matrix is less than or equal to times t to the identity, right? Um, okay, so that's, that's the idea. But by the way, how many people here have encountered or heard of SDP somewhere else, just for fun? You did? Cool, where, what context? Your theoretical computer science. Ah, there we go, awesome, right. Uh, did anyone know that you could actually solve them except for theoretically? Oh, not really. Okay, yeah, I thought so. Okay, that's fine. That's cool. Totally cool. I have lots of friends who do that. There was another one. Who saw it? Okay. Yes. Yeah. What? In statistics. In statistics. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay, good. So, so it's getting, I mean, it's obviously not totally mainstream or half the class would have raised their hand, but, you know, it's, it's, it's getting there. It's not like, it's not crazy stuff anymore. Um, okay. Um, oh, here's an interesting one. Like, um, minimize the, uh, this is the two norm. So that's the induced two norm. It's the maximum singular value, right, of, of a matrix. And it says, uh, please like minimize that over some affine set. And this too, you do the same, you do the same thing. You express this as a, uh, as a, an LMI, and then, then everything works out. And the conclusion is you, we could just solve these problems now. We just, we can just solve them. Uh, so it's actually, it's kind of interesting and cool. Um, yeah, so, okay. And I think what we'll do is we're gonna quit here. Um, we have one more, uh, one more very important topic on optimization uh, next week. And there we're, next week we're gonna do uh, duality, which is actually super interesting. It's still theoretical, but it's actually super practical.